In Racing Through Time, we look at the great drivers, the cars, the races and the circuits that made motorsport history. Silverstone is not set in majestic parklands or near an exotic beach. It's a windy former airfield in the Midlands of England. It's also the heartland of motor racing, the central point for most of the teams in Grand Prix racing. Silverstone has always been known for its high speeds, but in recent years the perimeter road that was nearly flat out for most of the lap has been cut down to size. It's the track to do well at. If you win there, the car workers of the sport take notice. Silverstone hosted the very first round of the World Championship in 1950, but how long it remains on the calendar is discussed each year. Despite its fame, Silverstone is accessed by two narrow country roads, and spectator access is often a problem. There's a feeling that something is always happening there. It has a purposeful atmosphere as the working centre of motor racing. A world-leading motor racing industry has grown up in the area, making a major contribution to the economy. In Racing Through Time, we look back at the famous races in Silverstone's history. Motor racing in England has long been confined to private tracks. On the continent, roads were closed off and races organised, but in England, this was not possible. By the 1930s, racing in England was at Brooklands, Donington, and on speed hill climbs at Shelsley Walsh. Post-war, Brooklands was sold off and Donington was turned into a vehicle dump. Motorsport was confined to speed hill climbs like Prescott. In 1947, a group of drivers met at the Mitre Oak Hotel in Ombersley. One of them suggested racing on the perimeter roads of Silverstone, one of many disused wartime airfields. Legend has it that the first trial race ended when a competitor collided with a sheep. The Royal Automobile Club negotiated a lease with the Ministry of Defence. Jimmy Brown was appointed the track manager, and the first meeting was the October 1948 British Grand Prix. An estimated 100,000 enthusiasts poured into the circuit, delayed by traffic jams, which have plagued the circuit ever since. Makeshift pits were put up at the farm, and hay bales marked out a 3.7-mile circuit, shaped like an hourglass, using the main runway. The original start-finish line was just after Abbey Corner. This was dominated by the four CLT Maseratis of Alberto Ascari and Luigi Valorese, but the old ERA of Bob Gerard was still competitive. As the Maseratis raced among themselves and fell by the wayside, the ERA was moving up through the field. Retired and refueled, Maseratis returned to the race. Eventually, it was Luigi Valorese who took the chequered flag and victory in the first British Grand Prix at Silverstone. Alberto Ascari was second, and Bob Gerard third. In 1949, the RAC organised a one-hour production sports car race to cater for the growing number of sporting cars. This was ideal for Jaguar, who just introduced the powerful XK120. Jaguar hired Prince Beera, Peter Walker and Leslie Johnson to drive the cars. Beera dominated the race until a burst tyre put him out. Eventually, the race was won by Leslie Johnson, cheered on by coachloads of Jaguar employees. This race can be considered the very beginning of touring car racing. The second Grand Prix in May 1949 saw a new circuit layout using the perimeter road. This created a very fast track and a new style of racing, the birth of the modern racetrack. Compared to today's smooth circuits, what was it like to drive on the rougher tracks of the 40s and 50s? Historic racing expert Willie Green. 
Some of the circuits then were so bumpy that if you didn't have independent front suspension, it tended to deflect the car and throw it offline. Um, nowadays, we're driving on billiard tables and you don't need suspension. So you really don't need geometry again. It's like, just like a big go-kart. And the BMX or cars handle a great deal better than any of the cars with independent front suspension. Luigi Valorese, the winner from the previous year, still with a 4 CLT. Royal teammates Prince Bira and Baron Emmanuel de Grafenried, both driving Maseratis for Enrico Plate. Only one Ferrari was entered for Raymond Mays, the very first thin wall Ferrari. Before the start, the drivers had time to speak to each other and to enjoy life. It was serious when they got out there on the track, but off track, there was fun. Lord Howe about to brief the drivers. Bob Gerrard and walking away, Raymond Mays on the right of picture. David Murray, later of Acuria Cos, and Roy Salvadori in the black overalls and helmet. They're away, the second British Grand Prix. It turned out to be a very fierce battle indeed at the front of the field between the Maserati 4 CLTs. Bira, at the top of his form, putting distance between himself and the opposition. Such distance that team owner Enrico Plate in the pits tried to slow him down. But Bira was pressing hard, anxious to increase his lead before the pit stops. De Graffenried comes in with car number two. Bob Gerrard in the ERA and now Bira flat out, but his brakes were fading. As De Graffenried went back into the race, Bira hit a marker barrel, damaging the car. He came into the pits to retire. There was little that Plate and the mechanics could do, so Bira got out of the car and urged De Graffenried to go quicker. Lord Howe talks to a disconsolate Plate. Rich Parnell comes in to retire his Maserati. Crash hat off already, he knows his race is run. Into the lead went Baron Emmanuel de Graffenried. The second of the Plate Maserati drivers held off the assault from the ERAs to take victory. Bira applauds, and Joan Gerrard congratulates her husband for a fine second place. Louis Rosio was third. Later in 1949, there was a Formula One race, sponsored by the Daily Express newspaper and known as the International Trophy. The winner, Alberto Ascari in the Ferrari 125, literally took the flag. Sinjin Jock Horsfall died in an accident during this race. Silverstone quickly became the center for major motorsports events, including motorcycle racing. Later, the British Grand Prix was held there before finding a permanent home at Donington. the greats, Jeff Duke and John Surtees. In the immediate post-war years, a cheap form of motor racing, if motor racing was ever cheap, was 500cc racing. Young drivers like Peter Collins and Sterling Moss learnt their craft in these motorcycle engine races on circuits like Silverstone. Because of the wide open spaces, Silverstone was considered safe, but the hay bales and high speeds caused dangerous accidents. The first event to qualify for the new World Championship was the Grand Prix de Europe, a title that replaced the British Grand Prix for 1950. For the race, the British royal family, led by King George, attended and were presented to the officials of the meeting and the drivers by Earl Howe. Alpha returned to Grand Prix racing and had the experienced trio of Juan Manuel Fangio, Luigi Fagioli and Nino Farina. 
Britain's own Grand Prix challenger, the immensely complex, noisy and difficult to drive BRM, wasn't ready to race. Ferrari too was absent from this race, so the main opposition was from the four CLT Maseratis of de Gravenried, Bira and Chiron. In the race, Farina took the lead for Alpha, followed by Fangio, Fagioli and guest driver Reg Parnell. Nino Farina was driving in his best style, relaxed, leaning back, arms out straight. He was dutifully followed by Fangio. Farina maintained his lead after the Alfetta's pit stops. Eight laps from the end, Fangio's engine started to sound rough and he pitted. The mechanics took one look under the bonnet and replaced it. The engine was ruined. The cause? A broken oil pipe. So Nino Farina won the first race of the new world championship, followed by Fagioli and Reg Parnell. A delighted Farina is presented with the winner's laurels. The 1951 season began with the Daily Express International Trophy meeting, which had now moved to May. Ferrari, although entered, didn't appear, which was a disappointment. Ferrari were represented by Reg Parnell's Thin Wall Special, which was a considerably modified 4.5 litre 375 Ferrari. It would be a final battle on a UK track between the Alfa Romeo drivers in their much modified 159s. The first heat was won by Fangio, with Parnell a close second. The second heat went to Farina, with Consalvo Sanesi second. As the cars were lining up for the final, the sky went dark, and one of those storms, for which Silverstone is infamous, burst over the circuit. Rain and hail poured down, and darkness descended. It was so dark, the drivers couldn't see where they were going, and were crashing all round the circuit. Bonetto led for Alpha until he was passed by Parnell and Duncan Hamilton's Talbot. Fangio was working his way up to fourth when the race was stopped after six laps. Reg Parnell was declared the winner, an unforgettable experience for those who took part, and only the British would try to race in those conditions. In 1951, the RAC decided to hand over the lease of Silverstone to the British Racing Drivers Club. The pits were moved from the farm to their current location on the straight between Woodcote Corner and Cops. The British crowds eagerly awaited the coming battle between Alfa and Ferrari, and local hope BRM was also present. From the start of the meeting, Froelan Gonzalez overshadowed everyone else. He broke the 100 mile an hour barrier in practice, lapping in 1 minute 43.4 seconds. In the race, Gonzalez led from Fangio, while Farina, Villarese and Ascari battled it out for third. Fangio then took the lead for a while, until he lost it to Gonzalez again at the pit stops. Ascari retired, and it was thought that he might take over Gonzalez's car. Although the Argentinian got out of the car, he was ushered back into the cockpit and sent out again to continue his good work. He was now leading Fangio by over a minute. Farina's car caught fire caused by a seized clutch. Ascari ended his race blowing the Ferrari. For the race he was third, Bonetto fourth, and the BRMs of Peter Walker and Reg Parnell were fifth and seventh. A delighted Gonzalez won Ferrari's first World Championship Grand Prix. In 1952, the change of the World Championship to Formula 2 regulations meant that small British teams could compete in the major races. Cooper, HWM, Connaught and ERA were able to compete, if not race wheel to wheel, with Ferrari and Maserati, the two front runners. It created a real boost for British drivers, hoping to make their way into Grand Prix racing. It was also another step in the growth of the British motor racing industry. The location in the Midlands, close to the motor industry, meant that Silverstone was often used for testing and launches. Farina managed to beat Ferrari teammate Ascari to pole position. At flagfall, Ascari made one of his great starts and immediately started to pull away. He was a great racer from the front of the field. 
Farina, in second place, had to pit for a plug change and dropped back, allowing Ascari to win again. Taruffi was second, and Farina sixth. Mike Hawthorne was third in a Cooper Bristol, a result that helped earn him a seat with Ferrari. The 1953 sports car race showed how popular this type of racing had become. Scottish team Acuria Cos had three production C-type Jaguars on show. Aston Martin were making their last appearance with a DB3. Mike Hawthorne had a powerful 4.1-litre V12 Ferrari to race. American Tom Cole with his 4.1-litre Ferrari. Mike Hawthorne with his father Leslie during practice. Leslie Hawthorne stands in the background, a proud father. Mike was now a fully-fledged member of the Ferrari team. Fraser Nash's were also well represented. Cliff Davis's Tojiro, the prototype of the AC Ace and ultimately the most copied car of all time, the AC Cobra. Sterling Moss had won the saloon car race in the Mark 7 Jaguar but had a big accident in practice for the sports car race and was severely bruised. Hawthorne inspects the Ferrari prior to the Le Mans style start. Moss chats with Jaguar boss William Lyons and Peter Walker also joins in the conversation. Underneath the green overalls, Moss was bruised and battered. He got away at the start first, but was soon to lose the lead. An Allard was an early retirement, and Hawthorne went on to dominate. Trying to keep up, a C-type goes on the grass, and Hawthorne perilously close to photographers. Hawthorne rushes past the pits with a lead over the Aston Martins and the Jaguar outclassed on home ground. Hawthorne pulled out a big lead and it was the private Ecuria cost Jaguars rather than the works cars battling with the Aston Martins. Tom Cole, Ferrari, and Peter Walker with the leading factory C-Type. cars driven by Ian Stewart and Hawthorne lapping tailenders. With Jaguar's success at Le Mans, sports car racing was big news in Britain, the one section of the sport where cars from the UK could compete internationally. This was part of the increasing pool of racing and engineering talent that developed in the 1950s. However, on this occasion, Mike Hawthorne and the big Ferrari showed everyone the way home at Silverstone in the 25-lap race. At the end of the race, the cars come back into the paddock. Moss is disappointed, and the Aston Martin team were also far from happy at their performance. The three-litre Aston Martin DB3 was short of pace. The third works C-type, followed by a Fraser Nash and Cliff Davis at the wheel of the Tojiro. In 1953, Mike Hawthorne arrived at Silverstone following his breakthrough Grand Prix win in France. This race nearly ended in disaster when he lost the Ferrari at Woodcote in front of the grandstands. Alberto Ascari, on his way to his second world championship, won from Fangio, Farina, Gonzalez and a recovering Hawthorne. In 1954, the new 2.5-litre formula was underway. 
The domination of the Mercedes and Reims caused concern to the opposition. The result of the next race, the British Grand Prix at Silverstone, restored some of their confidence. Fangio started from pole position, but the all-enveloping bodywork of the W196 restricted his visibility from the cockpit. This caused him to hit a number of marker barrels. He also had transmission trouble and finished fourth. His teammate, Carl Kling, could only manage seventh. Sterling Moss had put in a fine performance with his private Maserati and was well up with the leaders until his retirement with a damaged rear axle. He had a long battle with Mike Hawthorne. Moss abandoned his policy of driving only British-built cars. His family had purchased a Maserati Grand Prix car to give him the opportunity of winning races and impressing Mercedes-Benz with the express intention of driving for them. In what must still be a record, seven drivers were credited with the equal fastest lap. It was a Ferrari 1-2 with Froil and Gonzalez winning from Mike Hawthorne. Fangio's protégé, Onofre Marimon, was third in the Maserati. He died in the next race, the German Grand Prix at the Nürburgring. the British Grand Prix was held at Aintree near Liverpool and the race alternated with Silverstone until 1963. A new driver on the scene was Peter Collins, competing with BRM. The main race at Silverstone was the international trophy for Grand Prix cars. Mike Hawthorne was equal fastest with Roy Salvadori's 250F in practice. In the race, however, Mike soon retired the van wall. Peter Collins fought a race-long duel with Salvadori until he was able to pull away late in the race. Maserati 250Fs filled the top five places. A sign of things to come was Jack Brabham's seventh place in the central seat Cooper Alta. Mike Hawthorne joined Jaguar for sports and saloon car racing in 1955, replacing Sterling Moss. Drivers could compete for different Grand Prix and sports car companies at the same time. The sports car race at the International Trophy Meeting was a Jaguar versus Aston battle, with Mike Spencer's Ferrari continental opposition. Mike Hawthorne took the lead in the D-Type soon after the start and led for 37 of the 40 laps. He set a record on lap 32, but just three laps from the end, his radiator hose burst. He stopped, found that the engine wasn't overheating and crawled round in fourth place. Ahead of him were the Aston Martins of Reg Parnell and Roy Salvadori, and Tony Rolt in third. Duncan Hamilton finished fifth. In 1956, Mike Hawthorne signed with BRM. The Formula One season had started well, with a third in Argentina in BRM's own 250F Maserati. The BRM was a different matter. Rear-end problems at Goodwood and Aintree had damaged his confidence with the car. Dashing Roy Salvadori in the Maserati. Sterling Moss in the van wall. 
Was this to be, at last, the genuine British Grand Prix contender? Moss, Collins and Hawthorne on the front row of the international trophy. Hawthorne led only to retire when the timing gear stripped and Moss won from Archie Scott Brown and Desmond Titterington. In 1956, the Grand Prix returned to Silverstone from Aintree. Moss was with Maserati and Fangio had joined Ferrari. One of his teammates was Peter Collins. Hawthorne and Tony Brooks streaked away in the new BRMs until they both retired. In fact, Hawthorne led, retired and resigned from BRM all in a day. Then Moss and Roy Salvadori took over. Salvadori was driving a privately entered Maserati 250F and was well placed. This was his best chance to win a Grand Prix. Well, it was going very well. The car was handling very well, and um, we seemed to be going quicker than the works Maseratis. We had trouble with tank strap, which um, caused us some problems. Otherwise, we did have a chance of winning the Grand Prix. We continued with the same car for three years. Um, I think that we did have some larger carburetors fitted, but it was basically the same car. We were a little restricted on revs. Uh, we used to go through the season with the same engine, which was pretty, you know, apart from pulling it down a couple of times, uh, we'd go through without any spares, and uh, we had to limit our revs. It was very difficult racing as a privateer in those days against the works. You were really, you know, you were really sticking your neck out. You had to make sure that you were in the next race so that you had to limit your revs. Salvadori's race was destined to last another four laps. Engine problems caused his retirement. It was not to be a Maserati day because Sterling Moss had to pit with ignition trouble. He rejoined in second, but retired on the far side of the circuit. Fangio took his only British Grand Prix win with Peter Collins second and Lancia Ferrari won too. The 1958 International Trophy and the Ferrari twins Collins and Hawthorne were present. Peter won in the Dino 246, heading the Cooper of Roy Salvadori. In 1958, Ferrari continued their mid season Grand Prix fight back at Silverstone. Moss had set the fastest time and taken pole position for Van Wall. Harry Shell's BRM was next up with Salvadori's Cooper third and Hawthorne's Ferrari making up the fourth car on the front row. Moss was not confident. It seemed the Van Wall was having valve troubles. Nevertheless, he led away, only to be passed by Peter Collins, who made a brilliant start from the second row. Hawthorne slotted into third place with Moss behind him and Shell's BRM fourth. Collins was driving as well as ever. He began to pull away from Moss, who pursued him until lap 26, when he had to retire with a blown engine. This led Hawthorne up to second place. With Collins and Hawthorne well in the lead, the main interest in the race was the battle between Salvadori's Cooper and Lewis Evans with a van wall. Graham Hill had to retire his Lotus with a worn-out gearbox. Next, it was the turn of the gifted Alan Stacey having his first Grand Prix drive, and he retired with overheating. This amazing man drove in Grand Prix racing with one leg, which many people didn't realize. Then it was Cliff Allison's turn when he came in with no oil pressure. While a BRM is pushed away, Colin Chapman in the red shirt confers with his drivers.
Mike Hawthorne pitted for more oil, but managed to rejoin the race still in front of the Cooper Van Wall battle, and soon started to pull away again. Salvadori and Lewis Evans fought on to the end. Peter Collins crossed the line to win his first Grand Prix since 1956, followed by Hawthorne. The crowd waited for the battle for third. It was won by Salvadori by half a car's length from Lewis Evans. A delighted Collins and Hawthorne were greeted by the press. As Collins is presented with the trophy, it's sad to reflect that he was soon to lose his life. He died in the following race at the Nürburgring. It was also the period of the changeover from front to rear-engined cars. Before the start of the 1959 season, Sterling Moss tests the Rob Walker Cooper. They were based at the old farmyard. Mechanic Alf Francis in the white overalls. Preparation for the season involved a shakedown test and then development based on feedback from the races. A continuous testing regime of recent years really developed in the 1960s. Apart from Mercedes, Grand Prix teams were small in the 1950s. The driver, team owner, a mechanic, and a lap scorer was the total staff for many operations. Testing was limited by the resources available. The level of professionalism and engineering skill increased in the 1950s, as Sterling Moss explains. John Heap uh, designed the HW and he took the, took the thing and, and to weld it up, took bits off a standard Vanguard and mixed them together with bits off of something else and made a car. They, they weren't the sort of designs that we have nowadays, so art was brought up in a different era. And, uh, and they were just different people, and, and he, he was one of the greatest mechanics, in my mind, that, that ever lived of of that era. Jack Brabham in the Cooper led home former teammate Salvadori in the short-lived Aston Martin in the 1959 race. Apart from Ferrari, all the Grand Prix contenders were now from Britain, showing how much the Grand Prix scene had changed. In 1960, Lotus was on the way up. Innes Ireland had won the international trophy, but tragedy struck when Franco-American Harry Schell died in practice. In Grand Prix racing, a serious crash at Spa-Francorchamps had cost the life of Alan Stacey. Sterling Moss had crashed heavily and was at the British Grand Prix in a flag-waving capacity only. John Surtees was making a big impression in his first few races in a car. The man in form was Jack Brabham in the Cooper. Sterling Moss starts the race. showed that the new low-line Cooper was the car to watch. There was a surprise performance of another driver. Graham Hill in the rear-engine BRM had started badly on the grid, but he came through the field to take and pass Brabham and lead the race. Failing brakes caused him to spin at Cops, and Jack Brabham went on to win the race for Cooper. Graham walked back to the pits and became a new national figure, someone the public could take to their hearts. Australian Jack Brabham won the 1960 World Championship with fellow Antipodean New Zealander Bruce McLaren second. Cooper won their second manufacturer's award and Grand Prix racing was developing into a Commonwealth sport. 1960 was the peak of Cooper's achievements in Grand Prix racing. A change of formula in 1961 was to set British cars back, and Cooper's decline was swift, and the team could only manage fourth place in 61.
John Surtees raced a Lola in 1962, another new name on the racing scene. Lola had a long but disjointed career in Grand Prix racing. The 1962 Daily Express International Trophy at Silverstone was the first since Sterling Moss's serious accident at Goodwood. It produced a tremendous dice between the BRM of Graham Hill and the Lotus of Jim Clark. On the last corner, Hill passed Clark to narrowly win. Jim Clark was the dominant driver in the British Grand Prix winning at Silverstone, Aintree, and the new circuit on the calendar, Brands Hatch. In 1963, Jim Clark went on to take the first of his two world titles. Jackie Stewart made his breakthrough at the top level in the 1965 International Trophy. He'd been signed by BRM to partner Grand Hill. Hill had taken pole position, but in the race it was Stewart ahead of Ferrari's John Surtees and Mike Spence in the Lotus in the top three. Pedro Rodriguez was fourth and Joe Bonnier fifth. The 1965 British Grand Prix. The contenders, BRM's Graham Hill and Jackie Stewart. Dan Gurney, again with Brabham and the boss, Jack himself. John Surtees, the reigning world champion, and new Ferrari teammate Mike Spence. Jack Brabham looking serious prior to the start of the race. Lorenzo Bandini in the third of the Ferraris and Denny Halm enjoying his first Grand Prix season. Bruce McLaren still with Cooper and a young Jochen Rindt also in the Cooper team. In his Ireland, smoking a cigarette. A relaxed Jim Clark at the start. Clark ahead of the opposition. This was a masterly drive, and there was no challenger for Clark. As is often the case with great drivers, they can lead a race and win with a car that's in trouble. Throughout the race, Clark suffered from falling oil pressure. He'd been taking it very steadily round corners and making up his speed on the straights. This was the latest version of the 1.5-litre Coventry Climax engine. Graham Hill finished second in the BRM, and John Surtees was third in the Ferrari. The victory lap on the back of the Silverstone trailer. There were six Grand Prix victories for Jim Clark in 1965 and the second World Championship. Yeah. 1966 and the three-litre formula was ready for business. Best prepared was Jack Brabham with the Repco engine. That first success came in the International Trophy at Silverstone and Brabham proved that the three-litre Repco engine was competitive, including all that Ferrari and John Surtees could throw at it. fast curves, Jack was proving that he'd lost none of his skill as a driver. In the six years since he'd won the World Championship, he was giving away nothing to younger drivers, leading home Surtees in a Ferrari. At the same meeting was a round of the RAC Sports Car Championship. V8-powered sports cars were becoming popular, and Silverstone was the ideal track to stretch them out. Denny Holm in the Sid Taylor Lola T70 led home fellow Kiwi Chris Amon in the McLaren Oldsmobile. The rise in interest in the big sports cars paralleled the emergence of the Can-Am series in North America. All the leading cars for the Can-Am series in the 1960s were built in England.
1967 Grand Prix saw the three-litre cars growing in strength. The Ford DFV engine had made a stunning debut in Holland, and now at Silverstone, Graham Hill and Jim Clark were looking for more success. Reigning world champ Jack Brabham was in a fight with teammate Denny Hulm for the world title. Jim Clark chats to Sterling Moss prior to the start of the race. Clark was now a tax exile, showing how the financial side of the sport was starting to increase. A last-minute adjustment was made to Hill's car, which had been rebuilt following a practice accident. Graham Hill could have won, having dogged the wheel tracks of Clark during the early stages. He took over the lead, only to retire later in the race. Hill's British Grand Prix jinx continued, and he became an expert at walking back to the pits. Out goes the flag for the second Cosworth-powered victory. Denny Holm finished second in the Repco Brabham on his way to the 1967 World Championship. A new look for Grand Prix racing in 1969 with the introduction of advertising on cars. National colours were gradually disappearing, the first to go the green and yellow of Lotus, replaced by the red and gold of a cigarette sponsor. The Ford DFV engine was becoming the power unit of choice for many teams, the established and the new fully sponsored commercial operations. In 1969, Jackie Stewart played the part of the groovy Grand Prix driver with the big sideburns and the Dylan hat. He won the Grand Prix in the Ken Tyrrell run Matra Ford in the first of his championship years. In 1971, the BRDC negotiated the purchase of the entire 720-acre Silverstone estate and, free from constraints, pushed ahead with more development to turn Silverstone into a major motor racing center. Jaguars and Rovers at the start of the famous tourist trophy race in 1982. Silverstone continues to play an important role with international, European, national and local motorsport. A chicane was installed at Woodcock Corner, but the rest of the track was flat out, and in 1986, Keke Rosberg recorded the fastest ever lap in Grand Prix qualifying at over 260 kilometers an hour. That speed was only exceeded by Juan Pablo Montoya at Monza in 2002. Formula One testing is still an important part of Silverstone. Recent changes have reduced the testing time available, but there's the ability to go to the track and test in private if necessary. On-track testing can show things that computer simulations and predictions wouldn't always show. Formula 3 championship has long been an important stepping stone for aspiring Grand Prix drivers. World champions Sir Jackie Stewart and Jody Schechter confer before the start of a race. Stewart is the president of the British Racing Drivers Club, the club that have done so much to develop Silverstone. There have been many different circuit layouts at Silverstone over the years. The Grand Prix, Club, National, International are some of the variations. The corner names at Silverstone are evocative too. Cops, Maggots, Beckett's, Chapel, Stowe, Club, Abbey and Woodcote all reflect centuries of history in the area.
motor racing has become a big business, worth £5 billion a year to Britain. Grand Prix teams usually develop near the owners' homes. From Cooper and Surbiton came Brabham and McLaren. By the late 1960s, teams like March were heading towards Oxfordshire with the availability of skilled staff, improving motorway links and with Silverstone just up the road, making testing much easier. The motorsport organisations nearby read like a who's who. Williams, Jordan, TWR, BAR, Renault, Jaguar, ProDrive, Cosworth and Ilmore are all within 30 minutes of Silverstone. Many small suppliers and teams in lower categories are also based nearby. At the centre of all these enterprises is Silverstone. It's claimed that on the afternoon of the British Grand Prix, Silverstone's tiny aerodrome is the busiest airport in Europe as officials, team members and drivers beat the traffic jams and fly into and out of the circuit. The sights and sounds of the classic GT sports cars on the circuit as it was in 1992, with the old stow and club corners before they were permanently changed. Ferraris, E-types, Aston Martins in the Coys Festival, which developed into one of the world's great historic motorsport gatherings, giving enthusiasts the chance to see these famous cars and drivers in action. has been slowed down for safety and commercial reasons. The required 300 kilometers of a Grand Prix was taking less than an hour and a half to complete, so it had to be slowed down to fill TV slots. Round Stowe Corner and down to Clow. corner was put in before the Woodcock chicane to slow the cars further. This was followed in 1992 by a complete reconfiguration of the track with a new infield section before Woodcock, profiling Beckett's and a slower section known as Vale between Stowe and Club Corners. The track has been altered slightly since then, but retains most of the changes made in 1992. We go on board with historic racer Willie Green at full tilt in an E-Type Jaguar. Silverstone has also been famous for its hairs. There have been some lucky and unlucky attempts to cross the track during races. BRDC successfully developed a motor racing industrial park beside the track in the 1980s. And the track is always busy with testing, racing school activities, or rented for major events. In an effort to increase use, a national circuit was laid out, which can be run independently from the club circuit. While access to the circuit has been improved, the Grand Prix future of Silverstone always seems to be at the whim of decision-makers with vested interests. 
Silverstone has a unique history, despite its barren and windswept appearance. The circuit has an important place in British motorsport, past, present, and hopefully future.